afternoon, Michael Malice here, and let that be your welcome for the next hour. We have with us a really special guest, <laughs> Terry Shepard. You are a retired Green Beret. Yes. You're the uh, star master sergeant. Yeah, retired master sergeant. Yeah, host of Hollywood Weapons on the Outdoor Channel and Amazon Prime. Yes, sir. You're probably the second toughest person I know. <laughs> Besides yourself. Besides Matt Hughes. Oh, Matt Hughes is Matt Hughes is really. Of course, you wrote. The, by the way, I read that book. How I, someone read it to you? I, no, I. That's not nice. <laughs> that's true. I read it. It was good. It was really good. I'm not hearing a no. <laughs> it was really good. It was really good book. Actually. It was really well. You're an idiot. <laughs> Why am I here? Why, I mean, you're welcome. You're welcome for your freedom. Now. Yeah, this thank is what you. I, I appreciate you. my freedom. Yeah. So you are. Uh, what's really funny to me is I know a lot of guys who are like actual alphas, like you and Matt. And you are never macho. Like, people who actually know how to kill other people with their bare hands don't feel the need to be like, I'm so tough. Yeah, well, I think people... I, I, there's this thing about talking about alpha males. I, I don't think that has... Because uh, there's the exterior alpha male thing, and that's kind of the loud, annoying, maybe maybe, maybe uh, compensatory aggression, yeah. right? As opposed to just most of the... And I, I'm middle of the road, nothing. I'm, I'm nothing special, either in my community and special forces or anything. All the guys I know, and I know a lot of great, really, really dangerous guys. They're the nicest, most humble people I've ever met. UFC guys, too. I mean, those guys, what do they have to prove? Right. You know, they have nothing to prove. And when, whenever I was hanging out with them, if people went up to them and be like, oh, I could kick your ass, they'd be like, you probably can. Yeah, sure. Like, yeah, yeah sure. they're like, have a nice day. <laughs> yeah, like, okay. they're not, yeah, yeah. And Matt Hughes is, Matt Hughes really, he was he was an interesting guy, uh, a critical guy to, to the UFC and, and the whole MMA world because he really came in and just crushed people because he was a high level wrestler. Yes. And 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 uh so wrestlers I've noticed cuz I've tra I I train jiu-jitsu now and muay thai and stuff. I'm old. I just do it to stay in shape and if I'm I'm inherently lazy. So if I'm going to sweat and get hurt, I'm not going to do CrossFit. I'm going to do something that reinforces some kind of combat skill right. cuz you only have so much time. But but Matt came in as a just a wrestlers are some of the toughest guys you ever you'll ever train with because they have been grinding their whole life. Wrestlers are tough people. And so it's also and it's a critical skill in the ring. Uh, takedowns and takedown defense and all this kind. Of, those guys move differently. They're really and he and he's strong. Oh man! And he just he just whipped the shit out of everybody. So when you watch movies like Gross Point Blank, are you watching the show Barry on HBO? I've seen a couple episodes of it. It was pretty yeah with uh, Hater. Yeah, it's yeah. pretty funny actually. But see, like when I watch movie like shows and they talk about authors and like the writing process and the publishing process, yeah. like my autism spikes because it's like not real. <laughs> so when you're watching, oh, okay, yeah. when you're watching like these hitmen and whatever they do and how they with the weaponry, how true to life is it? And how much does it bother you when it's not? Some of it's I, I think it's gotten better. I haven't seen you know it's funny I don't even remember seeing uh maybe i've only seen one or one and a half episodes i don't remember anything specifically gun wise with hater i think a lot of the quality of that the gun stuff has gotten better um because there's a lot of guys now that are involved in the in the industry that come in as combat advisors and tactical advisors so the old days in the 70s where you see everybody looks like charlie's angels and and doing the gun stuff you really don't see that anymore um and when i do it actually tells me that that show's just kind of lazy because there's a lot of people out there that are just can help you with this and say no that's not the way we move and it's never as glamorous in real life as as probably matt would have told you or anything it, it i i also it doesn't bother me too much because i know it's hollywood i i know it's a tv show and it's a movie so if you really watch a real fight um or even if you watch if you if you know what's going on in the ring in an MMA match, you'll hear the crowd booing when these guys are on the ground. You don't see much going on. I find it fascinating because I know what they're working for. I know what they're doing. But it's not maybe interesting visually. So I think you you take it back to the movie stuff. I, I think they want to make it interesting and dramatic. You need to see it. You need to see what's going on. So like, you know, even I've done a lot of stage combat. I used to fence and stuff like that. So a lot of the things we do on stage it's not really necessarily real because you wouldn't really even see it. It's over before you before you start. So I don't. It doesn't bother me that much unless it's really egregious. And then I'm like, come on, man. One of the things that bothers me. I used to watch a lot of WWE as a kid. WWF when it of was. Of course, Bobby we Heenan. all did. Man. Bobby Heenan was my idol, right? We all did. So Ziggler got me tickets to Madison Square Garden. I hadn't seen wrestling in 25 years, 
and the fight dynamics were the same. And now I was angry because it's like now we've had the UFC, so people know how a fight actually works. Right. They know the the, yeah. the dance. And it's, these are the same moves. I'm like, that's not what would happen. That's not real. Yeah, well, that's true. And that, that, the UFC... And, and I, you know what? If someone's behind you, turn around. Yes. <laughs> like, you're a professional. You're a world champion. Yeah. There might be someone behind you. Yeah, that's probably... You don't want... And even in, in, in jiu-jitsu and all those other kind of things, too, you really don't want to give your back to, to <laughs> right? somebody because they're going to choke you out. And yeah, I, I think a lot of stuff gets exploded by reality. And that's, you know, mixed martial arts, the world of mixed martial arts is... Change everything. We owe debt of, debt of gratitude to the Gray Seasons. They brought that in, and I think the first one was in ninety two. Yeah, it was a long time ago. And here comes this guy, uh, not a big guy, not not a huge, scary looking guy. Hoist Gracie. He comes in wearing a gi, and they're like, "Who is this cat?" And next thing you know, he's on the ground with someone, and he's just like an anaconda. And they get up and they tap. They're like, "What just happened to me?" And it took a long time. It took a while for people to catch up. Now it's kind of even across. The Brazilians are still. They're the Brazilians. They're they're great, you know. But that that knowledge, just like when karate came to the United States from Japan after the war, no one in the United States had really seen it, you know. And so it was like, holy crap, how do we deal with these guys? And once that information gets disseminated across a big spectrum of people, you have people all over the world practicing different martial arts, and they're just it just keeps elevating. And and there's there is reality, and even the ring is the the guy Matt Hughes will tell you and. Um, any any you know MMA guy who fights in the ring that there's there's got to be artificialities built into that as well because you you don't want to rip a guy's nuts off or or take his eyes out because that doesn't work so there's got to be some of that because there's the, an MMA fight is an MMA fight a, a fight outside for your life right here outside this door that's different and so uh, that that's another thing too so you've served. Well, how many tours did you do? So I did. So it was weird, man. I I was I was, I was went to college at University of North Carolina at Wilmington, and uh, I was a bio major for three years. And at the end of the third year, I was tired of being in a lab. I was just bored with it. And um, and then I decided to switch to anthropology. That's what I ended up graduating with a year later. But on a random event, I was at my friend's place, and uh, he had a book about the Green Berets in Vietnam. So I was like, oh man, let me read that. Couldn't put it down. Went home, cover to cover. And what impressed me the most about it was uh, not the stories and the missions and stuff because they were har- you're like, holy crap, these guys. It was these black and white pictures of these cats that came out of the woods and they're, some of them are pre-mission pictures and some of them are after the mission and they got their, they're wearing tiger stripe fatigues and, and you know, they're, they're dirty, sweaty, they got their arms right, black guys, white guys, Montan yards. And, you know, you realize some of those guys in those pictures never, they didn't come back from yeah. that mission and these dudes were smiling and I thought, fuck, these guys just cheated death and that's what they look like. I want to be that guy. So I never, I finished. Just like Justin Trudeau. <laughs> it's exactly you like You want to him. be the black guy. I want to be, I want to put makeup on. Uh, well, you do, don't you? In many of these of missions? Course, yeah. Of course you do. Yeah, by the way, because it's also got a mental intimidation factor. Of course. You come oh, walking yeah. down, you come breaking into a house or down a road and you have the, all they see is these blue devil eyes. You look really scary. Yeah. And it is camouflage, but it's also, it's an intimidation factor too because you're just like, you, you you look less human. When you look less human in combat, you you actually add little to your side. But so I graduated, I, I enlisted in the army. My father was not happy because, you know, he put me through school. I had to work during college to, for spending money, but he, you know, I enlisted. I was, an, I was just talking to Eric out there. I was an infantry guy in the 82nd Airborne, which is a great place to, to grow up in the army because we all went to ranger school. We went to, I, I trained at Panama or jungle school, went to like a Rakondo school at Bragg. I was in the Gulf War for like nine months. And when I came back, I tried out for special forces, went through what's called selection, made that. And then I was went through the training to be a special forces medic, which is what I always wanted to do. And then I um, was assigned uh, to a unit in Germany, uh, Charlie 110. And I was there till June of 97. So I was in for about nine years close wow. to. And I was like, again, I was thinking to myself, what? I kind of checked off what I wanted to do. It was Bill Clinton's army. Uh, it was kind of weird. Some of the money and training was, and we weren't at war. We weren't at war. So I thought, uh, what, what do I want to do now? You know, it's, it's almost like this, okay, I did this. Do I want to do another 12 years? Eh, probably not. So I got out and um, came back to New York City where I'm from. I went to uh, 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 classical theater conservatory, Circle in the Square Theater School for two years. Graduated from there and I was living and working in the city as an actor doing a lot of theater, working at nightclubs, running security, and do, I was the velvet rope guy, very nice, polite one. Uh, and then 9-11 happened, 
And I was like, fuck, do I go on auditions or get back in the fight? I would, I've been out for four and a half years, but I'd stayed in shape and trained a lot. So I re-enlisted in the National Guard Special Forces in October 2001. And I just retired from them. I say, I keep saying just retired. It's been a few years now. I, I retired in 20, October 2016. Uh, one of the things that we as civilians don't appreciate, uh, you know a lot of people who, in, and I'm not even asking about you personally, but I'm sure your colleagues who have killed people, right, in war or whatever. Of course. Uh, That's the job. Right. Is it how, I'm sure there's also a bell curve of reactions. Some people are fine with it. Some people, so like, talk to me. I'm sure you've talked to many of them. Does it fuck up your head? There is a price to be paid. There is a price to be paid, and it happens in the civilian world in New York City. It happens. There is a price to be paid for having violence inflicted on you, and it also there is a price to be paid for inflicting it on others. They're just it's a psychic, emotional, almost physical penalty. It really is. You're and not I'm a sociopath. A, well, it, it's 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 not that. No, I'm saying a sociopath wouldn't care. Oh right, yeah. Because oh, you're yes, not one. You're right. Yeah. yeah. If, if it didn't affect you, I, I would wonder what's wrong with you. Now, guys, everybody deals with it differently. Some cats are able to really compartmentalize it. Um, some guys, it, it, it very, very obviously affects, uh, but everybody has to find a way to get it done. And then, you know, and, but, you know, it, it all depends too what happens when you get out. What I've seen problems in, and uh, I'll, I'll be quite frank with you, when I retired in October 2016, I'd been in for almost 25 years. I was a team sergeant. I was in charge of my own team. My marriage fell apart. I had just turned 50, 50 whatever, and I'm 53 now. And I had thought about killing myself because I was like, it doesn't get better. Like I, all my physical, everything I did, my physical peak is over. My peak aren't, is over. Aren't you, don't you wish you could go back and slap yourself in the face? Because well, when, when we're all in those dark places, we yeah. think, oh, this is it. And it's like, life, yeah. there's so and, much and, more. And, 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 it wasn't, right, and it wasn't, woe is me. I no, wasn't like, yeah, you know, yeah. it was just, I was just like, I was tired. And I was like, fuck, let me just, realistically looking at this, I am now going to grow old and die in a VA hospital with no kids. Right. Uh, I can't do the shit I used to do physically. I was at the top of my game for a long time. So I've seen it all. I've, uh, I've been that kid. It's yeah, all. Yeah. It's all done. And it, 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 but it was just, re and it was really beating me down. And uh, and I am in. I remember what saved me. I was living at. I live at the beach in the Outer Banks, and I was there by myself. And I had an old. I had a rescue dog that I had adopted from Salt Lake City oh. Shelter. That I I adopt seniors. I rescue senior dogs. And I had been uh, teaching a sniper course out there a few years before. And I, had I walked into the shelter one day and I, I had a day off. And I go, hey, anybody, old, anybody got, you got any old dogs nobody wants? And they're like, that guy. And he was this coon hound lab. Big, he looked like Eeyore the donkey. No, I was like, he's mine. So when I finished the, the, the training, training the guys, I picked him up and I drove him cross country back to New York. I probably, had, no one knew anything okay. about him. I think he was probably six, okay. eight. Not he, was that probably, old. he was probably eight. Okay. Which isn't senior. I adopted, yeah. I've adopted much older ones. And he was with me through the divorce. He was living with me down at the beach. And I had that, I had that gun in my hand sitting at the end of my bed. And I, I, it wasn't up to my head, but I was really like, ah, you know, man, it's pretty easy to do. And I looked at the dog. I looked at Rooney. His name, I named him Rooney. And I, and this is, this is what really completely shut it down. I looked at him, I go, fuck man, someone has to feed you. Yeah. Yeah. Of course. Somebody has to feed you. So, and then, and then I, then I, then the next leap of course was I would destroy my parents. Yeah. I would destroy my friends, my, my brother. I would destroy all the guys I went to combat with who we all came back alive. It would dishonor the guys I lost, you know? So it, 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 I tell people this, man, if you make it about you, you will pull the trigger. Yes. Yeah. You'll pull the trigger, man, because why not? It's just you like, Hey, I kind of want to start the next journey, whatever this is, cross the river sticks or whatever you do. If you make it about you, you'll do that. If you make it about other people, or in my case, senior dogs, I teach diving for a, for a, 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 a combat a guys who wounded in combat a charity. I try to do it that way now because that keeps. If I can help other people, even in a small way, or animals in a small way, I know it sounds trite. If I do that, then I, I'm I'm not going to go down that path because it's kind of selfish. I I I'll never say badly. I'll never talk badly about someone who does it because I know what that pain is like. As a matter of fact, I ride a Harley Davidson that belonged to one of my best friends in special forces who committed suicide in 2007. I've never modified the bike. I won't modify it. I won't change it at all. I mean, I keep it up. Yeah, I keep it in good state. But he, he, he went down that path and I talked to him the day before, the day before he did it. And I knew shit was going on with him and I'd reached out to him. And he called me and said, no, I'm, it was the day before 4th of July. He killed himself on 4th of July. 
I, I think it's so good that people like you talk about things like this. Yeah, my heart races even talking about it. I think when it, other people think no one has ever felt the way I do. Yeah, you you're know? nothing special. And it's like other people felt this way. Talk to them. You can, you can wait till tomorrow. Give it a week. Exactly, you man. Know? And it's and it's not a woe is me. Oh, my my pain. I hate my yeah. No, man. It's I get it. I get it. And yeah. and it's just, you know, it's, it's, and it's, again, man, there's days I wake up, man, I don't feel like fucking waking up. I'm, you know, at the old way, I combat it by, by trying to stay active. I do, I exercise, I train a lot. I dive. I'm busy. If I don't stay busy, I, it, it you do kind of sink that way. I didn't mean to get heavy with it. I didn't even think we were talking about this, but it really, I tell people, man, if don't, if you make it about you, you're going to go down the road. Don't make it about you. Michael Miles here. I want to tell you guys about our sponsor, Blue Chew, B L U E Chew.com, promo code Malice. All you have to do is pay $5 for shipping for your first order. Blue Chew is the chewables with the same active ingredients as Viagra and Cialis. They work faster than pills. It's a free online physician consult, it's cheaper than those other two. You just connect with the physician online. You don't got to go to a doctor. There's no awkward conversation. There's no waiting in line at a pharmacy. It ships to your door in discreet packaging. Five bucks, guys. Ladies, I don't know what'll happen. It's worth a shot. As if women listen to the show. If you go to bluechew.com, B-L-U-E chew.com, promo code malice, it's just $5 for shipping. You know what their slogan is? Chew it and do it. I can't speak on that but i can't speak of the fact that it's the same thing that's prescribed and it's only five dollars for your first order let's get back to the show it's it's very disturbing to me and i'm not a lefty at all how there's so much uh emphasis on social media to virtue signal and and have the right political views mm. where it's like you everyone listening to this has it in them to right now make someone's life profoundly better at very little cost. It doesn't cost anything. Go mentor a kid. Go talk to a senior citizen who's lonely. No. It'll take you 10 minutes. And I promise you, you'll feel better. Like I just found out my blood type is O positive. So I'm going to start. So is mine. Yeah. Okay. I'm going to start donating blood. Do it all the time. It takes me 10 minutes. It's going to save someone's life. I used to actually donate. And what I did, what I like to donate was double, double red cells. Because I'm like, you know, so I, I, they would actually take out, they, they cycle it through a machine and they take out two units in one unit. So probably don't train that day because you really you will feel, uh, one unit of blood, you don't even know, but okay. like two of them is like, you know, it's a lot of red cells, but that's the kind of shit in a trauma well, patient I'm, that they can really help. Well, I'm not going to inconvenience myself for someone else's life, but I yeah, will no, just there's, you, you can only go so far. Yeah, come on. You can only go so far. But, I, I, but I think you're right. Even coming here today, I, you know, I came from Midtown, I was on the train. Uh, it was kind of packed. I had sat down and you some, killed some homeless people no, to make some well, space. No, they, well, they deserve it because they don't have any soul. But, there you, go. Um, you know, some older gal got on the train and I got up and gave her my seat. She said, thank you. Okay, yeah, I guess you're getting your purple heart now. <laughs> yes, <laughs> yeah. Good, so, by the way. Lord, Terry. Again, I'm not in love with your tone because I'm trying to be, I'm trying to open with you. And I feel like you're just kind of hurting me in front of your friends. Is it in, <laughs> friends? Does he do this? Do to not you guys? address the staff. Does he, the do staff. not address the staff. The help. It Jeez. was bad enough you were talking to when we came in here. Yeah, I was. I know. I crossed the boundary. Didn't that, I? Well, he's gonna get fired. Yes. Hey, this I hard. got a. I, I got a job for you doing real shit instead of working with him. Just so you know. <laughs> you know. Yeah, he just slipped you off. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We're gonna have a talking to. Oh, yeah. we got a question from the chat room here, um, from Omar from Minnesota. If I were to drive into a crowd of civilians, should I use a truck at a slow speed or a fast car that's smaller? Are you really want me to answer that? Well, that's what Omar's asking from Minnesota. Just don't drive into a crowd. That's all I'm gonna say. Okay, fair answer. Yeah. Um, something, something that must trigger you, no pun intended, is when people like Kristen Gillibrand talk about silencers. Yeah. All right. Well, right. I mean, does it get you angry? Or do you think it's funny? Because it's it's. Do you think she's lying or do you think she's stupid? And explain what I mean. You know exactly. What well, I'm about. so so there's no such thing as a silencer, <laughs> right. right? They're called suppressors. And uh, actually, we did a big episode on Hollywood Weapons about this, about sort of showing what 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 really is. And and by the way, suppressors were invented. I, I want to say about a hundred years ago ish. And it was really to uh, decrease hearing damage. That's really the point of it. You, they're not silent. I mean, you can train. There's a couple guns I've shot with some long guns where we have can, we call them cans on it. You can actually not have hearing protection, but you can still you can hear it. So the thing with Gillibrand is 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 a bit maddening. And again, I put it on the people of New York. You voted her in. I mean, she ran on a platform a long time ago of you know because if you leave the city, 
go up north for a bit. It's deer hunters, it's country, it's it's real Second Amendment people. And she ran on that that whole idea of like, hey, you know, guns are part of our culture, we get it. And then, of course, now she's just, she's such a shill. I call her America's uh, ex-wife. That's a pretty good, that's good, actually. That's good, because she's... <laughs> And I think so many of them are like that. You know, we see we see Mr. O'Rourke, Robert O'Rourke. I won't call him Beto because that's not who he is. You know, a little while ago saying, no, you get it. You have an AR-15, you're illegal, so you keep it. Now he's like, no, we're going to actually come into your house and take it. That's always been their goal. Because again, the, I, I get it. You know, if you're not into guns, I get it. You know, but, but the, the Second Amendment, the whole point of the Second Amendment, it wasn't for, we know this, you've talked about it, hunting. It's not about hunting or target shooting. It's not even really to, to stop a criminal in your house is to keep the government from doing what they can possibly do. And history shows they do this. So it's funny that you think about, you know, when we were founded and we broke away from, from, from the crown, what if we had turned in all those muskets? There would be no United States. We wouldn't even be sitting here. So like there's some societal problems. There's some things to talk about with why that's going on. But if you look at the percentage of, of gun deaths and a friend of mine just wrote a great thread, another special forces guy, it's actually pretty small. That doesn't diminish the death of anybody who's like that. But there's a reason why the second, why, why so many people on the left, which they need to be, to be, to, according to, by design, the left has to control. There's no other way to do it. They, they have to, it's compulsive. It, it, it's, it's, they, they, they have to do that. And to do that, what do you, you have to have a citizenry that cannot fight back. And we're a gun culture, man. When, when, when World War II happened and they were asking Yamamoto if he was going to invade the United States, he was like, hell no, man. There'd be a, there'd be a, There'd be a, a guy with a rifle behind every tree because that's that's we know that. Yeah, uh, I wrote an article for The Observer a few years ago calling uh, for the case for mandating gun ownership, which has, just, has some, some history, uh, historical basis in America. Like back in the day, there used to be cities where you'd have to own a gun. Oh, really? Uh, I didn't even know that. Yeah. So my big focus, because I'm, I'm an anarchist, isn't the political stuff. It's the, the strategic aspect. Right? right. So if you have enough gun proliferation, they can flap their guns, their gums all they want in Washington. At a certain point, this is irrevocable. It means nothing. Right. So right. it's like if you have, and, and a, a good way for, uh, I would say, uh, pro 2A people to do things is to have, um, let's say, programs for poor people to get free guns. No, yeah, no one's ever, and the thing is too, uh, what, what bothers me about the whole story about this too is that you, you have people in the media and, and politicians as well Completely unchallenged when they say something Correct. like that. That if you're a gun person, you're a racist. Are you fucking kidding me? Like that's that's exactly what we're not. But but you're you're it's imperialism, right? So you have two cultures, and part what imperialism means. Progressive is a domesticate imperialism, right? So mm, traditionally, yeah. it's you take your country and you you put your culture onto another country. Right. What they're doing is they're going to take their urban culture and put on rural America. Exactly. And it's like, okay, we're not going to have this conversation. Right. We're going to have gun proliferation, and you guys can talk all you want. Do, yeah. And. But it's not. But it's. But the reality is, it's not going to happen. And, and we're not going to bother arguing with you because well, there's like, no talking to you. Yeah. Well, and it's also so so funny. And again, I just I wish some some people. This you've said it before, and you're totally right. You know, corporate media is the enemy of the people. Correct. People say you you could not be more correct. And I don't expect you to be disrespectful to anybody. I don't I don't want you to be disrespectful when you're a reporter. But at least ask questions. Like like these are there's they didn't they didn't ask Obama anything. They right. never really they never I wouldn't want you to be insulted. I mean he's not the antichrist when people are I was like, he's just a he's just a he's, he's just, just a, a nice Muslim guy. He's he's just a he's just a left wing guy. He's black, so I mean that gave him some 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 armor for because if you try to criticize, but I mean in a way, just ask these questions. Do you really mean that? When this person says this, what do you mean by that? And they never do. And I don't. And I don't understand. And that's why. That's why their credibility is shit. They're, it's. I think their credibility is very high. You do because the just, media. Yeah, because they're not speaking to you. They're speaking. They're training their own populace. Good point. So you're, that's a good point. I hadn't thought. I mean, I guess. Yeah, you're right. For their for their uh, fold, their credibility is perfect. Yes. Yeah. It's so actually, I, actually, yeah. Good point. I, I was really funny. The Daily Caller um, or Daily Wire. No, it was Daily Wire. They were, the New York Times, like last week, had an egg in their face because of Brett Kavanaugh, because they read oh, that story. Yeah, yeah. And they're like, oh, ha, 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 like they're losing their credibility. I'm like, no, they're not. When Trump gets attacked by the left, his people double down, right? Yeah. They're drawn to him. I, I never thought of it that so way. So when the yeah. New York Times is gets a air quotes mistake, the New York Times readers aren't going to be like uber jumping ship. They're like, no, 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 we got to protect our own. 100% right. That actually, that's a really good way. I never thought of it to frame it that way. That's actually something good you've done in the world um, is to is to frame it that way. Um, 
Yeah, I, I, I heard someone uh, on a show the other day calling in and talking about, well, you know, as long as the media keeps falling for that, they're not falling for anything. They're crafting it. Yes. They're actually, they're manufacturing. this, he was on a conservative talk show and he was, I forget, I don't want to say his name. I, I kind of forget it anyway, because I've been blown up a few times and my brain sucks. But I remember thinking to myself, dude, that's not the problem. It's not that they're falling for anything. They're, they're in on it. Yeah. They're in on it. They're, <laughs> right. They're, they're that's totally, their goal. They're, they're in on it. Yeah. So I, I like the idea. You're right. Their credibility for their, for who they talk to couldn't be better because they, and just like you said too, they are relentless. They are relentless, and I, what bothers me, I'm a con- I'm a conservative. You know, I know you're an, you call yourself an anarchist. I, you call yourself an anarchist. <laughs> I like that. This so-called anarchist. You call yourself. You wouldn't be here if there was anarchy, malice. You'd be dead in the street. But you know, as a as a conservative, where would they, why would there be streets? I don't it's anarchy. You, yeah, okay, God, dude, you we could go all day. Just light. Fuck, who's got the bong? Can we just do a couple bong rips and go, man? Have you tried DMT? <sighs> No laws, man. No laws, man. But uh, what was I going to say? Yeah, oh, as, uh, see, this is what I... It's damn it, elves. Dude. You're talking about uh, them crafting their narrative. Yeah. And, and as, as a, what, what's really frustrating... And the conservative show, some guy called in. Thank you very much. Thank you for bringing me back. I, I get the left. They're that who they are. They're not going to change. I, I kind of respect their ruthlessness about a yes. lot of this in a way, which is what we don't have on, on, on our side. We have these never Trumper, and it's not. I say never Trumper. It's take Trump out of the equation, but we have these conservatives, these people who are like you know these these spokespeople for us. They're writers, but they're not fighters, and they they're unwilling to see. It's easy to go ahead and sit back there and write an article for National Review online and clutch your pearls and say, "Well, this is bad." Yeah, I get it. But while you're doing that, while you're sipping your tea and looking down your nose at us and saying, you know. Your enemy, if you are a stated enemy of, of the left taking over the country, you should understand the fight. And Trump is, I, I've said this before on other shows, uh, people don't know what Green Berets do. Our real mission is, you know, there's different direct action units. We, that was really never our thing. We were formed after World War II. Um, the OSS broke up, Office of Strategic Services. They have great missions behind the enemy lines, Wild Bill Donovan. They split into two groups. The CIA and the U.S. Army Special Forces. We have a lot of con- we have a lot of kind of shared uh, stuff with those guys, and most of the guys in, in the Special Forces and Tenth Special Forces Group in the early fifties were Iron Curtain guys, guys who were actually from oh, yeah. Poland, from the Czech Republic. I speak Czech actually, and so our job was what was called UW, unconventional warfare, guerrilla warfare, and I've told people so. Our job is to go into some place and fight an insurgent, and either create an insurgency to take down somebody we don't like or to combat an insurgency for, for an ally of ours. And I, I, I want to tell the, these true cons, these, you know, these never Trumper type people, if you really are conservative, look at Trump as the, way, as the way I've had to look at some people I've had to work with downrange. So I've had to go and advise and work with people I know are bad guys. They're bad guys. You can look at, I call them reptiles. They have that look in their eye. That these, these are the kind of guys that would probably just kill a kid in the street, and not even think about it. We got it, Jews. <laughs> so you'd look at these guys and you like, this is a bad guy, but I, my purpose is to further the, further the aims of uh, United States yeah. foreign policy. Thus, my job is not to look down my nose at him and go, oh, you're a bad guy. I can't work with you. My job is to convince Uh, bribe, cajole, maybe even threaten, get this guy to go the way I want him to. Means to to an end. Exactly. And Trump is a means to an end for somebody like me. I consider him like the guerrilla chief on a country down range. I can get stuff from him. We can get, and he's delivered on a lot of things. It's been over a hundred years since Woodrow Wilson. At this point, if you're conserving, you're conserving the the winds of progressivism. Yeah, yeah. You're right. Actually, that's that's sort of true, man. And the National Review slogan, uh, I, I'm not a badass at all. I don't have tattoos. That's how you know I'm not a badass. Yeah, but I, I, there's a lot of people out there with tattoos that are not badass. Oh, I, I'm not I, a badass. I can name two. <laughs> for I'm not a badass. Okay. It's, um, it's just just ink. Their yeah. slogan is uh, standing athwart history yelling stop. So how about this? Why don't you yell and the rest of us are actually going to stop it? Yeah. I mean, even can you imagine your motto is I'm just going to stand here and yell while everything happens without my power. That that is a, a symbol of impotence. It's and it's so it's it's lazy and it's cowardly because because I get it. You don't have to love President Trump. Uh you don't have to but you, but you, it, it, his his character actually doesn't mean anything to me. Just like the character of the guy that I had to work alongside with over in Iraq. 
I wasn't really worried about, because I can't change that. I'm not going to affect, it doesn't fucking matter. What matters is what can I get from this guy to do what my, what my policy directives are to further the United States, whatever that is, whether you agree with it or not, that was my job. I was a green brain medic. I've delivered babies, pulled teeth, inoculated farm animals. I've, I've put tourniquets on people with legs blown off. I've helped the population just because, you know, but, but I don't make no mistake. My job to be there wasn't, I wasn't a, um, purely humanitarian. My job as part of a special forces A team, operational detachment A was to advance the foreign policy interests of the United States. If that meant doing humanitarian stuff, 100%. And I was good at that. And I, and I, and I like helping people. That is part of my job. That's why you're a medic. If my job was to lead and, and, and conduct a combat mission and kick down doors to go kill a bad guy, well, that's also, that's also part of it too. What, what's, what's infuriating to me about the Tom Nichols types and, uh, you know, David French, who I'm sure he's a very nice guy, but I see these guys, con well, Tom Nichols is just a fraud. He's just, you know, he's like, he, he wants to vote for a Democrat because that'll teach the, the, these dumb broobs in the middle America a lesson. Fuck you. <laughs> but you know, fuck you for, for you don't teach me anything. But like David, I'm, a, I'm unteachable, motherfucker. No, you can't teach me. I'm a rock. And I'm David, learning and, to save. And David French again, who I, I've read his stuff. I mean, I, I've read a lot of National Review. I used to have a subscription. I I actually owe them a debt of gratitude for being able to articulate my conservative viewpoint, and also that fired me up into read other books and other sources. I was like, so it was really it's we need them. We need those writers. But like the David French is, which I, I think he doesn't understand. I know he's in the military. He was a lawyer in the military. He wasn't a gun guy. But he's constantly clutching his pearls about our, you know, Trump's behavior. And, and it's like, dude, I get it. We, I know this. What, what's the end? What's the battlefield look like? Because the, the progressives, as you have articulated, have been on a battlefield for 100 years. We haven't even taken the field yet in a way. Yeah. You know, absolutely. I mean, we're starting to, I think. And that's why the left is afraid of that because like. Uh, we're kind of losing a little. They're sort of seeing what we've been getting over on them for a long time, and that's what pisses them off. It's never about Trump. This was never about Donald Trump. Right. It was about our compliance. We are not complying, and God damn, they're so pissed about it. I want to tell you guys about Wix.com. Go to LetThatBeYourWelcome.com. What Wix does is it lets you make websites easily from your house. Everyone listening to this should have their own domain name for very many obvious reasons and not obvious reasons. If someone Googles you from Tinder or from job interview or for they're writing a hit piece on you, you want your website to be the first result. Don't know how to make a website, that's what Wix is for. If you know how to use PowerPoint, it's just simple. You just pop it on the site, it's, just take a look. If you go to letthatbeyourwelcome.com, we've got a link at the bottom. Uh, you can also, but it's not just for simple stuff. People make online stores, live chat, an out of the box booking system. Anything you would want in a website, they have the tools to help you create it simply, easily, and quickly. They've got templates. It's really easy stuff. Go to letthatbeyourwelcome.com and you'll see the link at the bottom. And you can buy the um, theme song to this show and my book and other such low quality items. Let's get back to the show. If you used to read National Review, what was your first red pill moment? When I read a long time ago? Yeah, like what were you like, oh, when it clicked, like, oh, these I people want me dead. Oh, you mean National Review wants me dead? No, no, the progressives. Oh, ah, uh, it's hard to say. I mean, I always, there, must have, there wasn't a moment for you where you're like, oh. I, I think, actually, one of the things I read, well, first of all, even before that, like, you know, Jonah Goldberg wrote that great book, Liberal Fascism, which okay. that was like 2008. Yeah. I remember I read- It came out the same week as Matt's book. Yeah, did it? Is that when it came out? Yeah. yeah. And a very fine book. Um, and also, I remember in 2003-ish, Bernie Goldberg wrote that book, Bias, about media. So I would, so I, that's when I kind of started getting plugged into it. When I was in the, in the military and special forces in the 90s, I mean, I'm going to, I told you, I, I, I wanted to be that kind of guy. I wanted to be on that team. I wanted to be that kind of man. I love the country. And I love the United States. But it, was, it wasn't out of a patriotism. It was about, I needed to be tested. After I came back in after 9-11, that's when I just started seeing it. I started seeing like, hang on a second, man. You, you, the Dems, you, you got us, you, you voted to get us into Iraq. I went there and now you're calling it George Bush's war. How, how what the, right. what are you doing, man? Like you, you can't, you don't get to say that Hillary, John Kerry, Joe Biden, they all voted for it. And, and Bill Clinton was telling us that Saddam had to go back in the 90s. So- I started seeing this disingenuous, really paying attention to it. And I really back in and going on deployments. And then I just start reading books. I forget what, if I had a specific article, it just started all coming in. Like I'm being, these guys are liars at this point. Right. I, I get, I, they're lying to you. 
And I'm, I'm not saying that uh, conservative people have some uh, hold on, on virtue because we're humans. All humans suck. We, we are wired to be frail. We are wired to be weak. We are wired to make mistakes. As I'm a Catholic and I believe that that's the fest our cross is that we all kind of suck. But they're hiding behind a, a veneer right. of sincerity, of goodwill, of, hey, we want to help you. And it's the curtain's been pulled away, and I don't think they can pull it back now. Right. I don't think they can. We got another question from Omar from Minnesota. Oh my God! You're not driving a truck through a group of people. No. If you were going to shoot up a concert or nightclub, what would be the strategy to maximize de uh, civilian deaths? I would use a really good super soaker water gun. Okay. Yeah, that's it. Um, so now though, it must drive you crazy when you talk to conservatives mm. who laugh at this stuff. And they're like, oh, you know, ha, ha, ha. You know, they keep, they make this mistake, blah, blah. And it's are just... You, th these, uh, thank God these people were not in charge of me in combat because they'd get us killed. Yes, they would. They would yeah, get us killed because right. they're not seeing the battlefield. They, they, they're not seeing it. And, and like I said, it's not, it's not about... Tr Trump's going to be gone in a year or four years. Or, or, or eight. Did you or, see he stole my troll? No, no. What did he do? Is that how he's going to roll, run for president again? I said free troll, and this went viral. I said... Dude, you. by the way, I have to say this too. You are fucking great on Twitter. <laughs> you so are great. Fun. You're savage on Twitter. <laughs> and you always you always burn me too because I've never tried to get um, verified. And you, he's constantly, by the way, insulting me. He goes, oh, where's your blue check? I go, have you seen the people that you're that, that are in your league? Continue, but you're great on Twitter, man. It's it's gold. It's constant Wait, gold. For now you. I gotta ask: Do the everyone hates some hates somebody else? Do the Green Berets hate the Navy Seals? Who do you guys hate? Ah, uh, we don't hate each other. Oh uh, yeah, 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 blah blah. blah. No, we we, get, we cut to the chase. We, we, but but we talk a lot of shit. It's, about it's each the other. Navy Seals who are we, the rivals. Of course. Okay. So special forces and Navy Seals, and then you know there's, but you know Ranger Battalion might talk about these guys. We definitely. We definitely crack on So what's on each their other. stereotype about you and what's your stereotype about them? I think that for our stereotype, well, I'm going to still get in trouble for this. I think for us, the stereotype, we used to joke around, we used to joke around about the SEAL teams and say they're just a football team with machine guns. Ooh. But I've, dude, my cousin was a blah, SEAL. Blah, 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 yeah. Okay. But that was a joke. And they would probably say to us that we're just a bunch of pansies that, that, that <laughs> they can't swim. You know what I mean? So, but it, it, it honestly, really, when the rubber meets the road, there's so many good guys of in that course, community. Yeah. We, I, it, we're the shitheads in both of them. But it, the thing is with, with, with the military, and especially as you get, even into infantry, but especially in special operations, and even within the Green Berets, we're very clannish. So there's five active duty groups, two National Guard groups. Even the groups talk smack about each other because we're very, very clannish. And then with even in the battalions and yeah. that, this team might talk about this team. Push comes to shove, we'll kill for you. We'll, we'll go to war course, with you, yeah. but we will. It's very clannish. And so then you take the, you know, Army Special Forces versus SEALs and that's, we go back and forth, but we'd fight right alongside of each other. It, is, it's pretty good nature. There's been a couple things, but yeah. Let me show you how ignorant I am, okay? Yeah. This is not a joke question. It's going to sound like a joke to you. Is there literally a green beret that you get? Yeah. You actually get the little hat. Yeah, you get the little hat at the end of the training. It's there's a ceremony where you don berets. Actually, it's it's pretty 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 emotional. Of I mean, course, it, yeah. It's just a green piece of wool. The, but it's the symbol. Yeah, of course. It's the, the symbol Napoleon of it. Napoleon made that comment. I think it was Napoleon that like men will kill each other just for a little a, a ribbon. On 100%. The chest. Yeah. Dude, like guy, guys will re enlist to go to like Halo school or something like yeah. that because it's just that. It's a guy thing. It's a it's a it's a badge thing. But you know, and John Kennedy, you know, a Democrat president, he's our benefactor. If you go down to Fort Bragg, it's the John F. Kennedy Special Warfare Center and School. That's where that's the Green Beret School. That's where like you go with the, all the initial training, all the advanced schools are there. So here's JFK, a Democrat who would be hammered today, um, who was a you know big time anti-communist he's the army had wanted to take away our green berets because they thought ah it makes you guys seem too elitist oh yeah no there's okay. <laughs> trust there's a lot of shit in the military like this and uh kennedy came down and uh he was he came to fort bragg and they showed him this big capability exercise and he had a big thing and he was like no you guys are keeping this and i forget exactly the quote but it's like you know the green beret is a mark of distinction a badge a badge of, yeah. in, in the fight against freedom and the fight against communism and and, and for america's force i i've totally jacked that quote up but he's our benefactor john f jfk we owe our existence to jfk he they would have tried to get rid of us so is it the kind of thing you only wear the actual beret on special occasions yeah we wear that yeah you, that's another movie thing you'll never see dudes 
on target or out in the field wearing berets because right. it, it's a very ineffective piece of headgear. It doesn't really protect you. It's 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 hot in the summer and doesn't keep you warm in the winter. Uh, we wear it around garrison when we're walking around bases and and that kind of thing. We'll wear it for ceremonies and with our uniforms. Like if we're just if we're not out in the field. We'll generally wear it like on base and on garrison, but we're out in the field. You're kind of wearing whatever the hell you want. Is it the kind of thing where if someone gets lost, that that beret is handed to like the widow, or it becomes there's a, a lot of symbolism yeah, to that. Yeah. There's a lot of symbolism to that. Yeah, because it's it's kind of I mean, and and normally we don't call each other green berets. That's another thing. I, and guys in the community, we know this. When I've been on TV a lot, I've done a bunch of different shit. If I just say I'm special forces, people go, oh, my, my brother was a Marine. It's like, because it, it, there's, the, there's the special operations forces, which is a very big umbrella. It's got the SEALs, there's Air Force guys, Marines, Army, Army Green Berets and Rangers. But we call ourselves Green Berets just to delineate who we are for the civilian population because they don't know what we are. And that's kind of our fault. In a way, the special forces, U.S. Army special forces, Green Berets, We've been very quiet. We've been very quiet, and and, and and that's good. We're called the quiet professionals. What we you, you, we it's you got to be quiet, but you can't be silent because no one knows what the hell we do. Like we need to, we want guys from the these young studs coming up to know what we do. We're different. We're the only. I mean, that's changed now, but for the longest time, we're the only special operations forces that you had to have foreign language training. We learned the cultures of the places we're going to be living in because we're going to be there. Yeah. We're with yeah. these guys. And our mission was different. It wasn't to kick down doors and kill people. We can do that. Uh, our big thing was really training, advising, and leading foreign forces uh, as an extrapolate. And basically, our job is to work ourselves out of a job so that we can come back and let them do the fight. Yeah, yeah. Hasn't been effective in a lot of places. Um, there's some reasons for that. Yeah. You must be very good, and your colleagues must be very good at when you meet someone, sizing up very quickly if this person's Immediately. Tough, tough or not. Immediately. So there must be all sorts of little cues that are very obvious to you that the rest of us would be oblivious to. Yeah. So what would be some of those cues? Well, I think a lot, well, we're also called, um, and again, it's just we're kind of called warrior diplomats because you know we have to meet with, we'll meet with some pretty high level leaders to discuss what we're gonna do with their forces and to train them and things like that. I think it's always important because I, you know, look, I, I know a smattering of Arabic, but when I'm over in Iraq, I have to go through an interpreter. But you, ne when you're talking to someone with an interpreter, you never talk to the interpreter. Right. You talk to the guy. I may not understand a fucking word this guy is saying to me, and he's not going to understand me, but I'm looking at him, and I'll talk to the interpreter in my language. I go, listen, you need to make sure you say exactly what I tell you. If you're not clear about what I say, ask because this is very important don't don't kind of say oh, i think i know what he means and say, i need you need to really get this right understand okay cool now i'm talking to this guy and i just watch his body language i'm i look at his eyes i look at his facial facial characteristics look at how he wears his uniform it is it's it's really it's so what a, are some of the things you're looking for it's i know it's hard to articulate yeah it's, it's a, it's a I, yeah that's a, that's a really good question actually it's a very very cool question um i, I mean as far as like the weaknesses or something like, like that I, or like, just how to size guys yeah. up yeah again you can say okay here's something right away if if i look at a guy and i can see he's physically soft right like a lot of times in the middle east a lot of the officers they're they're not hard because they, they they have a different life. They're actually kind of imperial. They 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 go to foreign schools. They come back. They get these cush jobs. They don't give a shit about the guys underneath them. They're just cannon fodder for them. So I I, I automatically look at you, your body physically. Are you hard? Is is there some? Is there some? It doesn't. I'm, it doesn't have to be ripped. You know, CrossFit guy. But and you can also see if someone is hard. Is there is there a is there a hardness in their eyes? Is is but also it can be soft. I think I'm I I'm pretty communicative. I, I don't have to be hard and you know. I, it, yeah, that's a really good. I just it's a, the whole picture, man. How they how they look, how they wear their uniform, how they address me. Are they making eye contact with me? Are they kind of looking down? I'd have to really think about specifics on okay. that. But it's a very good question, man. But but you are right in saying that we have to do that. You have to evaluate a guy. Very, very quickly. And sometimes you don't get it right. You can be fooled. I've been fooled. I've been fooled. Not that much, but 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 you can you can fool people with that. Yeah, because you I can't fool people in combat though. Right. Well, I asked Matt. I go, can't. And Matt will probably tell you you can't. You can't. You're not gonna fool anybody on in the ring. No, but what I asked like, okay, you can't teach me how to fight very quickly. I said very quickly you could teach me how to stand so it looks like I know how to fight, and he did. That's a good idea. And I'm like, all right. So now at the very least, the person is gonna be. He's like, got to think about this. 
is there something else going on with this little guy? That's, gr- that's great. Yeah, dude, because that, and that's all part of it. And, and you're right, you don't have a lifetime like he has right. to devote to, to hardening your body and learning these combat skills. But you think about it, the first thing we see all is pattern recognition. Everything in life is pattern. That's why zebras fuck zebras. They don't fuck horses. It's pattern. And so you, everything is pattern recognition. And then what makes you notice things is pattern disruption. Like that's not right. You, you don't even think about it. Also, another thing for us is movement. When I went to sniper, the sniper course in, in, in the Army and Special Forces, you get busted on the stalks when you move. Yeah. Because they're looking for you. And if you, you can almost wear like a plain T-shirt, but if you put things in front of you and you move at the right time, you can actually get up really close without getting caught. But when you're under the gun, you know you have to take the shot a certain amount of time. Oh, fuck, I got to move a little bit. Get it, I got to get better. They'll get you. So movement, you, movement gives you away. And a change in the pattern gives you away. So getting back to what you asked about being to size somebody up, yeah, that's, that's, a good, that's clever of you to do that. Because if you stand a certain way, if I don't know you from anybody, right. I never underestimate anybody for their, I never underestimate buddy for being small or not big or anything. Because matter of fact, some of the, the toughest guys I know are not these big muscle guys. Just the way they carry themselves is a big thing. That's why it always pays to be nice. Always be nice, man. Always be polite. Always be, always be nice. Because you don't know who you're talking to. Yeah, this well, this guy I, might not look like much, but next thing you know, he's on your back and he's choking you out, or he's kicking your knee out from underneath you with a with a with a tie round kick. Just be nice. And a lot of times, I, when I was a door guy in 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 Manhattan at these clubs, there's guys who could whip my ass. There's guys I could probably take them, but I was always polite and always respectful to everybody that came up to the rope because I see a lot of places in New York. The guy looks at you and is like. Phew. How don't do that. First of all, that's a dick move. That's right. disrespectful. So always be respectful to people and that will cause them to not have to up the the ego fight. You know? And that's the way we do when we go overseas too. I don't go, I don't go in there when I'm dealing with foreign people, foreign militaries, foreign troops. I don't go in there and go, Yeah, the Green Braves are here. I'm gonna show you how it's done. That's a Navy SEAL move. <laughs> I'm not gonna say yes, but I'm not gonna say no. Uh, what are your techniques that you must also teach fight de escalation? Fight de-escalation. Yeah, of course. First of all, get a little space, right? Don't don't get too close. If you get really close to somebody, now you've you've up the threat because now you're within now you're within range of weapons. And it's also reptile brain. This person's in my space. It's a it's a phys- exactly. Yeah. That's there's a reason why the reptile brain takes over when your your frontal lobes go. Uh, uh, but the reptile brain is like boom. It's moving before you even think about it. Right. So for de-escalating again is be non-threatening. I, it's so funny. I see. It's so funny. I've seen guys on the street. We used to call us when we used to train. Um, uh, um, some of the guys I've trained with. Uh, we used to call. You know how guys walk up to each other and do this kind of thing, like getting your. T- we call that he's giving you a Christmas tree. All right. Yeah. He, he just doesn't get, want to fight. He's walking up to you within range of everything you have <laughs> going like this. That's how dogs show submission. They show you their belly. Yeah, but but he's he's doing that to scare you. Yeah. He's going up and bowing up on you. And he's going like this. It's like, we, we call Walt Lysak, my friend from Cento Martial Arts in Massachusetts, one of the toughest and nicest guys I've ever met. He's a killer, but the coolest guy. He's like, well, that's the Christmas tree. If a guy comes up and tries to bow his chest on you and go like this, take your pick. Take, take, what, take your pick on this guy because he's really not, he's not that good. And he's also foolish. He's foolish. And a lot of street stuff is that. A lot of, most street stuff is posturing. Oh, yeah. Most of it's posturing. Just look how easy it is to separate them. <laughs> Most of it's posturing because, again, when it really comes down to technique and bad stuff, it's like they don't really – because that takes training. You know, there's a lot of tough guys out there that have never trained a day that will whip most people's asses because they're fast, they're strong, and they're angry. You know, so hopefully some training will take over that. But, again, don't don't engage if you don't have to. Stand away, kind of get some distance. Don't – there's a difference between being submissive – and being, what's the word I want to use? Sub- De- deferential? Yeah. Res- there's a difference between being yeah. respectful and submissive. If you're submissive, you're telling him, come on, dude, take it. Right. Crush me. But if you're respectful, again, and are kind of, he's got to now think, do I really want to put, is this worth pushing? Right. Is this really and worth And is this a bad guy? Now he's being respectful to yeah, me. Yeah, like, now like he's wow. Not an he's, not, he's not calling me a dick. He's not impugning my sexuality. He's not calling me, he's not telling me, fuck, come on. Huh. Is this really worth? I used to tell guys at the bar all the time. I go, guys, listen, guys would roll up, you know, 10 guys deep wearing, you know, I'm like, guys, you're not, I can't get you in. Come back next week. Da, 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 or, or I would, I say, you come back next week. I will buy you a drink, but it's not happening tonight. It's New York City. It's plan B. Yeah. 
It's, still, it's, it's need- also really funny because people a lot on Twitter will be like, oh, you must have gotten your ass kicked a lot of times. I go, no, 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 no one's kicking my ass. Because when you're a big dude, you can't swing on a small guy. Yeah. And and there's no space for that. It's Fights are started by small guys who knows that the guy can't reciprocate. Small, guy, small wiry guys are difficult opponents. Yeah. Yeah, they are. They, in general. So again, no one should be an opponent unless you, you have no recourse. If you're like, this guy is gonna... I've been in situations where I'm like, this dude's gonna hit me. Yeah. I can count on one hand when I really felt that. It wasn't that many. And I've had a lot of guys kind of bow up and talk shit. I'm like, okay. Only a very few times am I, do I know, do I trust my thing? This guy, this guy is not going to not attack. So then I'm going to attack. I probably won't wait. Because then now he's giving me something to deal with. We got another question from the chat room. It's Omar again. From Omar, what is, uh, is this guy for real? If you're going to cut a pilot's throat, what brand of box cutter should you use? I'm not cutting a pilot's throat. Sorry, Omar. Omar's SOL. Yeah. Um, I'm not biting on this guy. Do you think you can teach someone to be tough? You could. T- uh, it's not as much teaching it as putting them through the crucible. So so I think everyone's got... I always tell people... People are a lot tougher than they think they are. That is for 100%. Let, let me... I, you just beat me to the punch. I've told guys, I said, there is steel within yeah. you. You just sometimes every now and then got to take it out and sharpen it. Yeah. It's all, everybody, dude, everybody can be a, a, a crazed primate and a very strong, dangerous person. Yep. You, I got goosebumps telling you this because it, it, that is a fact and don't ever think that's not the case. But I think it, it's not about teaching someone tough. It's revealing it to them, putting them in situations where they go, oh shit, I can do this, which is part of really all the training we go through, the ranger school, the Q course. They're not teaching you to be tough. They're putting it to you and giving you the opportunity yeah. to get through it. And then th- you find out for yourself if you're tough or not. And, and that's that's kind of how I do You don't really teach toughness, I think. You reveal it, and you temper it, and you kind of channel it. Because like you said, everybody can be tough. Are you familiar with one of my favorite organizations, Irreverent Warriors? No, no, I'm not. So they use dark humor and memes to help veterans who have mental health and suicidal ideation. So they right. do these silky... Well, we're dark guys, yeah. No, but the thing is, instead of you sitting at home looking at that gun, like you were saying, yeah. they have these silky walks where the guys are all in... In the ranger panties. Yeah, and the, but it's it's all a camaraderie Classic. where it's like, yeah, you're feeling fucked up. I'm feeling fucked up too. Let's be fucked up together. Yeah, yeah. but that camaraderie helps yeah. them. So I talk about this group whenever I can. Oh, I'll look them up. I, I, I don't know if I've heard of them or not, but that's... We are very irreverent yeah. guys. We are... It, it, in the combat military, I was telling this and knows this too. There's We're gonna have to edit. Please edit all these messages. To yeah. Is it bad we can't talk about them? Well, it's, it's. I mean, this is my show. There's no guest stars. He's here. really serious about this. I'm okay, not, I was not, talking to I'm a not, not serious. I was talking to, to a lad help. outside. I was talking to one of your employees, one of your minions, and it's funny because there is kind of two... minions is aspirational. Yes, we got to work our way up to minion. I, I have faith in you, Michael. Yeah. I don't ca- have faith in him. Ca- That's ca- what I'm saying. Shame on you, sir. Good yeah, day. Well, <laughs> good day. I say, I good, say good day, day. Sir. You get nothing. You lose. Good day, sir. There's kind of two militaries. There's the, the military, and it's a huge organization, right? Right. So there's the sort of tooth to tail ratio is quite quite. Quite, quite different. So the the little tip of the spear, are the guys who actually do the gunfights, infantry, combat arms, special ops, everything else is support. I tell you, if you're if you're an F sixteen pilot, I'm sorry, you're kind of supporting us. You're supporting the ground effort, really. I mean, you yeah. can bomb and stuff like that. But so, what was I talking about? We we're talking about something else about irreverent warriors. Irreverent warriors. We are. Thank you, God, dude. See, this, I'm serious. This is funny. I'm, I'm going to be 54, and this happens sometimes. I'll be talking and be like, "What was I talking about?" But luckily, you're paying attention. We are very, I've told people this before. If you could listen to us in our team rooms or downrange, yeah. you would think we are oh, the yeah. worst men in the world. You would think, because there's black guys on the team, Spanish guys on the team, Asian, Asian guys, the racial jokes, the sexuality jokes. That's how men bond. It, 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 and it's so, so I always say political correctness is a fake construct, right? It's fake. It's, it's fake because it's made to, to make somebody feel good about themselves, not really deal with the reality. We are irreverent, getting back to the reverent warriors, we are irreverent because fucking combat's irreverent. Death is irreverent. There's no, there's no, there's no coloring this the right way. So, so the be- best way to do it is to be brutal with each other in our humor. In the, yes. But I tell people, uh, you know, why did I go back in? You know, we love each other. Because love is not an emotion, it's a choice, it's a decision. So we love. I love my country, I love my family, and I love the guy to the left and right of me more than I love myself. And it was, when I came back in after 9-11, and I got back from my first deployment. My mom and dad were at the airport uh, at Fort Bragg. 
And my mom said to me, she goes, I haven't seen you look this happy in a long time. And I looked at her and I said, I'm back with the people that I love. Yeah. So, and, and when you, and family, that's family because family doesn't have boundaries like that really. So it's, especially in, in the combat thing. So guys like us moving out of the military uh, into the civilian world, we got, it's, it's difficult because again, the things we say and do are not understood. And, and in, in a politically correct, sort of very sensitive culture that, that doesn't deal with life and death in a, in a heartbeat, we can get jammed up for it. So it's good for guys like the Irreverent Warriors to do that kind of yes. shit because you're with the guys, you're like, you look at him and go, <laughs> okay, nice dick. And then off you go. But you can't do that out here. You can't do that out here. I think their calendar is something called like, sorry, dad. Because they're oh. like pausing their silkies like this. Like, all, you know, it's, I got to look these guys up. They're awesome. It sounds like a bunch of dudes on an A-team but or it, on an infantry squad. But that's the other thing. It's like the, you're speaking to these people on their level. Like they're not the kind of guys who are going to be wringing their hands and talking to some lady no. therapist. But they're no. like, all right. Yeah, you want to kill yourself? So do I. Let's go for a walk. Yeah, you're yeah, right. Yeah, yeah. Oh, 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 you feel bad today? <laughs> Right. Yeah. Come on, we got so let's get put on a rucksack and go. Yeah. No, I I so I will look those cats thing. up. Yeah, th that's that's the right way to think for us. That is the right way. And when I've told I remember I was at a wedding years ago, we came, we came in our dress uniforms to this one of my great friends in the unit is getting married and they, they asked me, "Hey, you're kind of old to still be doing this." <laughs> I was like, "Why do you still do it?" I go my one word answer surprised them. Love. We love each other. We love each other. And there's a lot of peer pressure too. Peer pressure is a good thing. In, 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 the, in, the, in the military, peer pressure, you don't want to be that guy. You don't want to be the weak dude who shows up last on the run. You don't want to be the guy who can't carry the, the you know, yeah. can't carry the fucking tripod for the machine gun. You, you don't want to be the guy who, who, who lets the team down. So that's peer pressure. So peer pressure is good it, to a degree. Peer pressure is actually get the ego is good to a degree. Having pride in what you do, being able to go, yeah, I kicked your ass on that, on that one. That's good. You know, you can't let any of those go too far, but all those things are good. And a lot of these things are being shut down by society to their detriment, I think. I got a question. I love having a good question where I, I have no guess as to what your answer is going to be. Yeah, because you probably have usually, usually a lot of que questions you probably like, I, I know what he might say. Yeah, yeah, this one I have no idea. Okay. Are you the kind of person where your adrenaline spikes very easily or is it that your adrenaline at this point is complete under your control? I, I don't. I, sometimes I don't know. That's a good question. Oh, okay. yeah. Sometimes sometimes it's different. Sometimes I'm surprisingly calm, and sometimes I'm like, holy fuck, I'm <laughs> I'm kind of ca classic example. Uh, in the recent times, I learned how to dive a closed circuit rebreather, a technical diving rig that you can go really deep in. Right. So I was in the initial. I was just down there in January learning how to do this because the, the guys I teach for the foundation with, they're all technical divers. I've always wanted to do it. I've always had a little bit of fear because it's. I teach regular scuba, but this is different. This is like if you make mistakes on this rig, you can very easily yeah, yeah. die. Mixed gases and stuff like that. And I had, we were coming up, we'd been on a long dive. And we were coming up, we had to do our decompression stuff at, at various stops. And for coming up, I had a problem where I wasn't getting, because it's a big loop, it comes in. I was getting diminishing breath. I was like, uh, and in mental shorthand, off the first breath, I go, this next breath is going to be less. And it was, but I'm always, I'm already ahead of it. It was an easily fixable thing by adding Dilly went to the loop technical shit, but I, I, I was just new to it. So I didn't know. And I, what happened was instead of free, I was only 20 feet below the surface. So I could have been pretty safe, probably rocket yeah. to the top. Might've had some problems. I could have done that, but I was like, I didn't freak out at all. Like I did exactly what we trained to do. I closed the loop, put it over my head went to the bailout rig and started breathing. And my instructor was like, you, and I was like, I'm cool. We finished the decompression schedule a little bit differently because it's a different, different gas. And he came up, he goes, what happened? I told him and he, and he goes, well, he, he told me how I could have easily fixed that. And uh, that'll never happen again. But he goes, hey, dude, you did a good job because you know, you're new to this and you didn't freak out. But you know, on another day, maybe I would have fucking panicked. So you don't, you, you know, you, that's why you have to, that's why I think you got to try and put yourself in situations where, that adrenaline spikes. I've never been in a fight, so I had my friend do a fight club with me just so I know what it's like. Yeah. I'm like, oh, this sucks. But it's not like this big monster in the back of my head. It's like, oh, this sucks. It's, yeah. it's, the other thing is I was always worried about doing squats. Like, what if I fail? Oh, and, like get and, hurt. Yeah, my friend just had to dump it. 
and I, and, he, and I'm like, oh, now I know what to do. It's annoying, but I'm not gonna be like a fucking. You're not gonna die. Yeah. So, yeah, but you're once, not gonna die. This, but that's great that you had that presence of mind. You're like, this is an opportunity because instead of I'm not actually in danger, but now I'll know what to do next time. It'll feel like I'm. In but danger. when you're underwater and you can't breathe, oh, of course, yeah, a lot of shit kicks in. Oh. So it's so it's, it's different than being like I'm uncomfortable. I was like, I have no air. I have no gas going into my mouth right now. You're, you're, it's easy to panic. That's how, that's how a lot of guys get jammed up on anything. You just panic. So I kind of got lucky that day. I just was like, I was already kind of thinking ahead. I go, this next breath is going to be diminished. And as I was breathing it, I was already getting ready to go to the bailout. Now, maybe I could have done it effed up another time, but it was, it, man, that built my confidence. Cause like we came to the surface and I still had like several days of this ahead of me. And I was like, I've already had a bailout. Yeah. Yeah. I've already had a bailout real. We practice bailing out anyway, cause you got to know what to do. But I actually had a bailout, meaning that I could not breathe and I had to go to my backup. So, okay, it's doable. It's doable. Have you ever had Rapture of the Deep? Is that a real thing? Yeah, narked. You get narked. Oh, yeah. Tell yeah, me yeah. what that's I like. I was just, well, you know, I've never really noticed. So I was just in Saipan. I, I work with, uh, we teach wounded special ops guys how to dive. And this summer, this is the second summer we went out there. We work with East Carolina University Maritime Archaeology Program. So we're excavating an underwater Hellcat wreck shot down 75 years ago. Wow. Okay. Yeah. While we were there this time though, four of us that are uh, rebreather guys got tasked to go try to find this bomber that, that I think is down in the trench, but we did some deep dives on that. And I was dropping with my partner and dropping pretty fast. And it was weird. It's so clear. It's really weird. You get this weird and you didn't see, and also the bottom's coming up. I'm like, okay, cool. Wow. I'm really going, moving pretty fast. And I got to like 130 feet. And I've been down that deep before. Wow. Well, no, that's not even that but, deep. So, I mean, for me, it's just like, oh my for God. For a rebreather, yeah, yeah. that's not that deep. Okay. But but it's really not. That's, that's kind of the entry level for a rebreather. But I've been down that deep on just open circuit shit. And I don't remember feeling this. I, I've always felt, you felt, sometimes you feel a little bit of elation. Like I'm down on a deep wreck and I'm like, oh, this feels cool, man. Yeah. This time, I actually felt like shit was spinning. Oh, so I was really getting nervous because I started looking at my gauges. I have this computer here. I got a, a, um, a uh, heads up display on my mouthpiece here. I got even a ba and I'm looking at shit going, everything's cool. I, my oxygen sense, everything's good. I shouldn't be feeling this. Like I was feeling, I wasn't feeling weird. I was feeling like dizzy. Like I almost was going to throw up like vertigo. And my buddy looked at me and he's like, you all right? And I was like, just give me a second, man. And I kind of, we, we went up a little bit. I went up about 10 feet and it kind of cleared up. And then we finished it. We were down there for a long time, actually. But my point is I had, I've been diving, my, I've never really felt it quite that way. Huh. And that's, 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 it's, you know, it's called uh, nitrogen narcosis. It's yeah. inner gas coming in, Yeah. It's a diving thing, but I've, I've felt elated and kind of like a little bit goofy, but not like that. So, and you never know when it's going to hit. You just know as soon as, and if, when I, when my first happened, I thought, oh, I'm in trouble. Yeah. I was almost going to bail out again and go to a different uh, bailout box. I thought, something's wrong with my rig, but no, that's cool. But my my that's cool. thought it was the whole thing where people feel that way and they want to just go dive da down further and it's kill themselves. Well, that's ha especially what happens with guys get jammed up on that when, you're doing like a wall dive, like in the Caymans or something, where it just drops into the abyss. It's kind of freaky looking. And you're, it, the water's clear. So you, it's easy to fool yourself if you're not really checking and paying attention. You're, you're dropping. And the more, you know, the more you go deeper, everything on you gets compressed. Your wetsuit gets compressed. Your, your, the air in your BC, your buoyancy. Kind of, so you start, you actually drop even faster because you're continuing, all the things are getting compressed. So you're like, and you don't, you, if you're not paying attention, dude, you're like, holy crap, people have found themselves at really bad depths and then they have to still have enough gas to come up and do a decompression, oh stuff gosh. like that. But diving is the best thing. It's it's my really my now my favorite thing to do. Uh, Terry, we're running out of time. Are we really? What has been... I've been telling about you myself the whole time. It feels so good. What has been your favorite part of this interview? Laughing with you, man. And actually, I'm going to remember a couple things about the the credibility the credibility of the left is not diminished. It's actually increased. But dude, it's been so long. I mean, like we've been talking about this for a while. Saw you in the green room. Big fan of yours. Big fan of your work, man. I really dig it. And then the fact that I got to come down here and talk to you for, for an hour. Has it been an hour? Have you been talking for an hour? Pretty close? You are welcome. 